Well, thank you, Roger. I'm grateful for Tabasco sauce. <laughs> I'll tell you what, that spices up some of the bad food I eat. <laughs> I regret it later, uh, but it's always good. Um, and so it's exciting to have the president and CEO uh, of Tabasco Sauce joining us uh, from Louisiana today. Uh, Tony has a passion for family business, obviously, because his business, his family business, has been around for 200 years. That's amazing. He was just telling me he, he, ninth generation. That's just hard to imagine. We don't have any ninth generation businesses here, so we're going to learn a lot from Tony today. Uh, Meantime, he runs a very large, successful, marketing-driven business, so it'll be interesting to hear his stories on that. Um, as I said, he's the president and CEO. He joined the company in January of 2000. He uh, started out as executive vice president, was promoted to president in 2012. Uh, I should bring up the slide here so you can see him. Um, he uh, became the chief, added the title of chief executive officer in 2013. So he does travel the country uh, talking about his business and his family. As I said, he's very passionate about that. He's been featured on 60 Minutes. They did a segment on uh, his company and Tabasco sauce. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Tony Simmons. Good morning. So he just did a very nice segue for me into uh, our presentation from 60 Minutes. I was going to start with that. So <clears throat> let's see. Okay. Um, as we were saying, uh, well, 200, well, this says 150. So we have two different family businesses. One is called Avery Island Inc., and we'll talk about that, and that's 1818. And the other one is McElhenney Company, which is the maker of Tabasco sauce. Uh, and this year we're going to celebrate uh, our 150th birthday. Now, CNN's Sanjay Gupta on assignment for 60 Minutes. Tabasco is more than a mere condiment. It's an American artifact. The sauce was first made in 1868, and within a few years, it was being served in the White House. Since then, it's made its way to nearly every country in the world. It's one of America's most prolific exports, which is why we decided to take a closer look. And what we discovered is that every bottle of Tabasco has been made by the same family, a very private family, producing their famous sauce, known locally as Cajun ketchup, on their very own private island in the middle of Cajun country for five generations. The McElhenney clan has done it by adhering to 150 years of tradition in how they make their sauce and also what they say about it publicly, which is typically very little. Letting 60 Minutes come in with our cameras and our questions was a break from tradition. The story will continue in a moment. Avery Island is located in the bayous of Louisiana, west of New Orleans. Only two miles wide, the island has been owned by the McElhenneys and their family for almost 200 years. This is where we take our pepper mash. It's 9 a.m. That means Tony Simmons, the fifth generation CEO, is heading to the warehouse for his daily taste test. Hello. Farmers all over the world grow the peppers, mash them, and ship it all back to Avery Island. You do this every morning that you're here? Every morning I'm here. I, I check these barrels if they're making mash. Where's this from, Clark? Columbia. That means every bottle of Tabasco in the world has his personal seal of approval. So I'm looking at the color, and that's why I've got an incandescent light. I want to look at the color. I want to look at the seed. And when I taste the mash, usually what I'm looking for is I get some salt out on the edges of my tongue. Uh huh. And then about the time you think, well, this isn't that much of a big deal, <laughs> the heat comes late. Did you want to try it? Sure. I'm, I'm watching you first. Uh, how I do that? this every morning. It's not so bad for me. Is that a good chunk? Yeah, that's good. That's and good. Just put it on the front of your tongue and then just let it sit there for a minute. If you, you think ahead. Tabasco is hot, Take the raw ingredients are ten times hotter. And then the, heat, the heat kicks in. <laughs> I have newfound Peru. respect. Peru. Tastes like candy. <laughs> Tastes like candy? Smells like money. Huh? Smells like <laughs> <Andor. laughs> 
Are, are there secrets in here, though, that you don't want the rest of the world to know? Our formula is only red Tabasco mash, vinegar, and a little bit of salt. So I don't know how many secrets we could really have with a process that simple. It was Simmons's great-great-grandfather, Edmund McElhenney, who created the sauce shortly after the Civil War. He began selling his concoction in old cologne bottles in New Orleans, calling it Tabasco. There was no commercially sold hot sauce before Tabasco. Edmund invented the category. He is sort of the father of hot sauce. He's the father of hot sauce. That would make this the first family of hot sauce. <laughs> that sounds real good. <laughs> the first family of hot sauce turned Tabasco into one of the oldest and largest family owned and operated businesses in the country. You're the fifth generation family member to run this business. Mm -hmm. How unlikely a story is this? Only 30% of companies outlive the founder or move to a second generation, and only 12% of companies actually make it to the third generation. So for us to be the fifth generation and still be doing this is a much smaller subset, I'm sure. From the beginning, the company has always been run by and for family members. The top management, board, and 130 stockholders are all McElhenney descendants. Estimates are that the sales are close to $200 million a year. Am I in the right ballpark? You're probably in the right town. You know. <laughs> could, could you put me in a better ballpark? No. We, we, like I said, we just don't give out financial information. What about margins, profit margins? Can you talk about that? Nope. None of it? None of it. It's a private family hell business. Is there any advantage to not sharing this information? We're not sure, but we're probably not going to find out either. <laughs> Harold Took Osborne, another of Edmund's great-great-grandsons and Tony Simmons' younger cousin, is next in line to run the company. Everyone calls you Took. I mean, you're one of the senior guys in the company, the number two. What does that say about this culture here? When I came here, I, I put my name in, the, in the, uh, the company directory as Harold. I didn't get any calls for the first <laughs> six months because no one knew who Harold Osborne was. They all knew me as Took. A decade from now, will one of the best known companies in the world be run by a guy named Took? Well, we might, we might change that a little bit. <laughs> They're going to call you Mr. Took? Mr. Took. <laughs> Even though he's the heir to the Tabasco crown, Osborne inspects the pepper bushes himself much as his ancestors did, as this company film shows. You have to walk through the field and we take rope and we say this plant, that plant. But you can almost see the personality of the plants and then we tie string around them and come back and pick just those plants for next year's season. The company grows peppers on 20 acres of Avery Island, not to produce sauce, but to produce seeds, which are sent to farmers abroad. It's an, essentially an heirloom plant, essentially the original stock. So you're saying the, these peppers are genetically the same as the original peppers? As far as we know, yes. We, we've never modified them. These peppers are hand-picked. Why not use a machine or some sort of automation to make that easier? We don't want to change the plant. That's the way most, like in the cucumber world or potatoes or anything else, you modify the plant to work for a harvester. Every time you breed something, you give away something, and taste is always the first thing that gets cast away. Key to the taste of the sauce are the seeds, and they're irreplaceable. We have a vault in our, in our office. And we a, keep vault? Them, a vault? We keep, them, keep seeds in the vault. Keep seeds in the vault. Farmers in Latin America and Africa use those seeds to grow 10 million pounds of peppers. They mix them with salt, grind them, and ship the mash back to Avery Island, where it's aged in oak barrels that were once used by the finest whiskey makers in the country. The barrels do have to be modified, though, in particular, the metal hoops. We'll have to put stainless steel on them. Why? The acidity of the peppers. The peppers could eat through the steel that's on there in the first Correct. place? Correct. Coy Booty is in charge of the warehouse. He's also a fourth-generation Tabasco employee, something that's pretty common around here. My grandfather, he ran our processing department. Uh, my mom works in our HR department, and my dad runs our maintenance shop. How big a part of your life would you say Tabasco is? I guess my whole life I was born and raised here. Do you eat Tabasco every day? I eat Tabasco every day, morning, lunch, and supper. As the mash slumbers for three years, spider webs grow on the 60,000 barrel inventory. The last time I saw this many barrels is usually a place like a winery. 
We think about our process similar to the way I think a winemaker would think about his process. Once Simmons approves the mash, it moves on to the next pungent stage. We add vinegar to fill the tank, and then we mix it and stir it for up to about 28 days. And the, you get the, get your, you get the uh, take vinegar. Take your away. Come on. <laughs> you ever, <coughs> you ever get used to it? I don't know if you can get used to it, but it doesn't affect you quite as much if you, after, if a you while. after a while. The sauce is then strained and bottled. The company's 200-person workforce can produce more than 700,000 bottles a day. This is a big product around the world. I mean, how big are we talking about? We are currently shipping to 166 countries. Do you want to be in every country in the world? Well, yes, we do. <laughs> Great, man. Meanwhile, the hot sauce industry in the U.S. is on fire with revenue of more than a billion dollars. Eating spicy food has risen in popularity. It's even become a competitive sport. You got hotter? This will be a 20 minute burn. As can be seen at this chili festival near Dallas. Lately, Tabasco, the grandfather of condiments, is trying to keep pace with these brash new rivals. The market itself has been growing. And the more people that come into this category, we think the better it is. Because if you begin to use hot sauce, we think sooner or later you're going to find Tabasco, and when you do, we're going to get you. <laughs> you got to hook them. We're going to hook them. Avery Island is located in hurricane country, making Tabasco very vulnerable. In 2005, Hurricane Rita caused massive flooding. How at risk was Tabasco? We had four inches before water would have come into a food plant, and you can imagine we would have been shut down for months and months. That's very close to being on the edge. It's the only place in the world we make Tabasco. In order for the family to protect Tabasco, they must first protect Avery Island. Fighting the erosion of Louisiana's picturesque bayous is a constant challenge for Took Osborne. Some of the problems that we have are saltwater intrusion. If you bring direct sea salt in, it will it'll kill all this grass. Without the grass, the area's biodiversity will also disappear. So the company has a program to replant new grass. It's an indigenous grass, so it's very inexpensive to do. It's very effective. It grows fast. What you see here is this grass will start spreading out by the, by the roots, and it stops the, the sediment that's floating by, it, and it, the sediment drops out and builds marsh. In just a few years, this will turn into this. As much as they like to talk about their conservation efforts, the family also leases their land for oil and gas drilling, as well as salt mining. Those two things seem at odds with one another. No, because we use those resources to, to actually help the parts of the land where the oil isn't. How does that benefit Avery Island and Tabasco? All this land protects the island, protects it from storm, protects it from erosion, and it's part of our heritage. That heritage includes unique Cajun musical and culinary traditions that the McElhenney family cherishes. If you work on the, uh, the leg, you I'm can get Connor. some of that nice crab meat out oh, yeah. by bringing that leg out. And at the heart of Cajun cuisine is Cajun ketchup. C could you do what you've done here with Tabasco someplace other than Avery Island? I think we could make Tabasco, but I'm not sure that the joy would be anywhere near as great if it, if it wasn't being done where it is. They are fiercely protective of their island, their business, and their sauce, which has been trademarked since 1906. Now that I've been here for a couple of days, I sort of feel like I got the, the formula for this Tabasco <laughs> down. And if I wanted to go out and create Sanjay's Tabasco sauce, what would happen to me? If you called it Sanjay's Tabasco sauce, you'd get a cease and desist letter from us pretty quickly saying that you can't use the word Tabasco in that context. You could call it Sanjay's hot sauce made with Tabasco peppers, but you couldn't call it Sanjay's Tabasco sauce. How far would you guys go to enforce that? We'll go to court with you. Absolutely. There will be no other Tabasco sauces out there? No. There have been rumors that there have been offers for purchase of Tabasco. Mm -hmm. People would offer a billion dollars, maybe even more. Is there any amount of money that would make this company for sale. 
the shareholders of the company would have to decide what they want to do. And they say, Mr. CEO, what's your recommendation? You know, I like owning a family business. <laughs> So, <laughs> thank you. Two things about that piece. Um, it, one, it took 60 minutes, two years, to talk me into doing it. When the producer, uh, Sumi Agira, finally got me on the phone after about uh, 13 or 14 months, she said, Tony, why won't you talk to me? And I said, Sumi, you're 60 minutes. I said, what CEO in his right mind invites 60 minutes into the company? I said, you guys do gotcha stuff. And she said, we think you all have a wonderful story to tell. I promise you it's not a hit piece, and I promise you it will be, um, you know, a good piece. She said, we do so much hard edge reporting that we like to intersperse it with some stories that are just more of a feel-good thing to take some of the edge off. And I think, as you can see, she kept her word. She did a very nice 13-minute uh, infomercial on Tabasco that uh, ran in March of 2013, uh, 2014, and then they reran it again in August of 2014. And CBS tells us that they had 11 million viewers the first time it ran and another 9 million viewers the second time it ran for a total of somewhere around 20 million people who saw that 13-minute prime time uh, description of Tabasco and our family business. The interesting thing was sales moved zero. It didn't do anything for us, nothing. Um, we saw no change in our sales or in patterns uh, from that. And that told us that if a 13-minute infomercial in prime time that you couldn't buy from that type of publicity um, didn't move the needle. It really didn't make a lot of sense for us to spend money on marketing in mass communications because obviously everybody has already decided they think they know what we are and they're either going to use us or they're not going to use us. So we had to look at how we can use our money, our, our marketing funds effectively because it didn't appear that television or mass media was going to be able to do anything for us. And so we have switched all of our uh, dollars, all of our marketing dollars, into either uh, shopper marketing, in-store promotion work actually in the stores, or to uh, social digital media. And it is amazing, as many of y'all probably already are aware, that if someone wants to watch, uh, say, a video clip on ESPN on their mobile app or on their laptop or wherever, um, they can be served a small trailer before they get to watch their video clip. And it's sophisticated enough to where you can purchase the concept that this person is in the demographic we're trying to reach. This is the person who we think we have a potential to do something with. So we're going to have you serve them a small 10 or 15 second trailer uh, about us before they can shift to uh, the video they want to see. And then we can measure how many of them actually, how long they stay on it. If, you know, after 10 seconds you can skip the ad. How many of them stay on and keep watching? because then we can serve those people different things based on the fact that they're going deeper. It's become very sophisticated on social digital marketing and how you can use it. And part of the reason that we've shifted over to doing that is what I, that infomercial 60 Minutes uh, told us about how we can spend money effectively. Obviously, outside the United States, we sell a lot of products, so we have to use different methods. But inside the U.S., we and even outside the U.S., we've started to use um, things like this, where this would be served to uh, someone who, say, looking is on the Internet or on their mobile device. They can shut it off after a few seconds, but this is the type of marketing that we're doing a lot of now. There is a phrase that is often repeated here. 
The land has been good to us, so we're good to it. The land is Avery Island, Louisiana. Blessed with fertile soil, decorated by Mother Nature and Spanish moss, and standing above a most useful salt dome. The environment and resources give it purpose. Its geology makes it a world of its own. For five generations, our family company has worked this land to grow our heirloom pepper seedlings, use salt from our mine, and produce a product that is desired around the world. We've also worked to replant marshes, care for our fields, and follow a nothing wasted approach to creating our pepper sauce. We share this island with indigenous animals and plants. In 1895, Bird City was founded and built by McElhenney family members to help provide safe habitat for the then endangered snowy egret. Those egrets return each spring to nest. And in 1935, Jungle Gardens was opened to showcase local and exotic flowers and plants among enduring oak trees. Avery Island is not just a sanctuary for plants and birds, but also for a way of life. Our product and our people are intertwined with the food and lifestyle of Cajun country. This is where we work, but it's also where we fish the bayous, get our hands dirty, and call home. We're proud of the Tabasco pepper sauce we've made since the 1800s, and we're just as proud of the place where we come from. It's a place where traditions are preserved, and so too is the land. So that's the type of marketing we're doing now. Um, uh, it's been very effective for us. Um, in the retail environment, we saw our market share drop regularly as this category expanded and expanded and expanded. Um, for those of y'all who do go to the grocery store, uh, you may remember that the condiment aisle, the hot sauce set would be about this big. Now it's in some cases, it's six foot wide and four or five shelves deep. There's an enormous amount of offerings out there that used to never be there. And we have had to try to find ways to compete in an ever-increasing environment. People say, Tony, what keeps you up at night? I tell them trying to make a 150-year-old product relevant to an 18-year-old is what keeps me up at night. How do you sell to them? Because they don't want to be sold to. How do you reach them? Because they're not really interested in watching television or listening to the radio. More likely, they're getting all of their information off of some type of mobile device or app. And if they are watching television, like as not, they've pre-recorded it, and they're going to they're gonna run through anything that's a commercial uh, or anything that's trying to sell them. So uh, we've shifted almost entirely to that. But our story doesn't really start uh, with Edmund McElhenney in Tabasco. Our story actually starts uh, with Avery Island. Um, this is a picture of Avery Island. It's, it's, as I said, it's about two miles in, in, uh, uh, in diameter, about 2,200 acres of land, and it's in the marshes of South Louisiana, um, but it's a giant mountain of salt underneath Avery Island. Um, it's, it's a rock salt. It looks like a quartz crystal. It doesn't look like table salt, although if you grind it, it becomes table salt, and it's almost completely pure. Uh, but that giant mountain of salt that formed underneath uh, our land pushed the land up. The highest point on Avery Island is about 162 feet above sea level, and that is the highest point along the, the Gulf Coast of the United States between Brownsville, Texas, and uh, Key West, Florida. So um, Avery Island uh, was formerly called Petitance Island, because the bayou you see running around on the right side there goes out and goes uh, into Vermilion Bay and then flows into the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, for a long time it was called Petitance Island, but uh, by 1867 my family had purchased all of Avery Island and gradually over time it became known as Avery Island instead of Petitance Island. But our story actually starts uh, with this man, uh, John Craig Marsh from Railway, New Jersey. And in 1818, he purchased roughly a third of what is now called Avery Island 
to f start a sugarcane plantation. And uh, he uh, moved down, he worked the land, he got his sugarcane plantation started, and his daughter, Sarah Craig Marsh, uh, met, fell in love with, and eventually married Daniel Avery. And um, they are the genesis of our uh, family business, Avery Island Incorporated. I run two family businesses for my family. One is Avery Island Inc. and the other one is McElhenney Company, the maker of Tabasco sauce. But um, Daniel Dudley Avery and Sarah Craig Marsh uh, worked together uh, on Avery Island and that started in 1818. So this year, while we're celebrating 150 years of making Tabasco, we had our 200th family reunion on Avery Island and um, we have 467 living cousins of which about 350 of them showed up over Easter uh, to attend uh, our 200th family uh, reunion. That is a seventh generation family business with its ninth generation of shareholders. Um, we primarily do land work in that um, we own the minerals, the salt underneath the island. Cargill is actually the uh, operator. They have an operating lease from us to mine the salt and they uh, have about 100 people employed in mining salt underneath Avery Island. It's actually the oldest rock salt mine in the United States. Um, also, McElhenney Company, the Tabasco Company, leases all of its land on Avery Island from Avery Island Incorporated uh, as another family business. So uh, Avery Island Inc., as I said, has been there uh, and been working for uh, since 1818 for 200 years. But um, this is Edmund McElhenney, the inventor of Tabasco. This is actually a copy of an ad we ran in something called Chili Pepper Magazine 25 or 30 years ago because uh, Edmund uh, was a banker from New Orleans. He was actually born in Hagerstown, Maryland in 1815. And um, his father uh, owned a uh, shop there. Uh, we don't know a lot about Edmund's young life, but we do know that he ended up in New Orleans uh, by somewhere around 1840 and went to work in the banking business for the Bank of Louisiana. Um, we, we did this ad because, as it said, banker, entrepreneur, and a monster chili head. And a chili head is a term that they use uh, to refer to people who like a lot of hot sauce and really like hot things. So uh, we ran this in Chili Pepper magazine and, and thought it was a good ad. Um, in sometime around 1853, 54, uh, Edmund purchased five branches of their banks from the Bank of Louisiana and became an independent banker. And um, as he traveled around uh, South Louisiana calling on his branches, he became very good friends with uh, Daniel Avery. This is a picture of Mary Eliza Avery, uh, Daniel Avery and uh, Sarah Craig Marsh's daughter. And uh, on her 20th birthday, Edmund McElhenney, who was a lifelong bachelor and was at that time 40 years old, uh, approached his good friend, uh, Daniel Avery, and told him that he actually was secretly in love with his 20-year-old daughter and asked for permission to marry. This didn't go over too good. Um, Daniel Avery was not real happy with his 40-year-old friend uh, sporting his 20-year-old daughter, but Mary Eliza finally convinced her father uh, that she was in love with Edmund and, and they let the marriage go through, but there was a 20 year age difference between them. So in 1859, uh, they married. This is a picture of a Tabasco pepper plant and our pepper plant is a little unusual in some ways for a pepper plant. One, it doesn't all come ripe together. If you've ever seen say a jalapeno bush, uh, all of the jalapeno peppers are the same color on the bush. That's not gonna happen on a Tabasco plant. On a Tabasco plant, it's a little hard to see, but there's some yellow pepper, there's red pepper, there's green pepper, there's actually orange pepper. Our product is natural, so the only way we can control the color of the product in the bottle is to only pick the reddest, ripest pepper. So the only thing that can do that is a human. 
and we have to go back through the fields over and over and over again, only picking the pepper that has become fully ripe in order to control uh, the color of the product. The heat stays the same from the time the pepper uh, comes up, but the color makes a big difference and it also adds to the flavor becoming fully mature. But um, Edmund tells us, he, he was a banker by trade, so he kept very meticulous records. And uh, Edmund tells us that when he got back to the, to the Avery Island at the end of the Civil War, um, he found one of his Tabasco pepper plants growing at the side of the chicken coop. And as my cousin Took said in the 60 minute uh, piece, uh, every plant we plant today comes from that one plant uh, that Edmund found at the chicken coop. Where'd he get the plant? We don't know. We don't know. We've got a couple of family stories, uh, but we employ a full-time PhD and historian as our archivist, Dr. Shane Bernard. And Dr. Bernard does a very good job of trying to separate the truth and the family stories, which can be very difficult. But we don't honestly know where Edmund got the peppers from. Uh, one of the family stories is that uh, he was given them from someone in New Orleans who knew how much he liked uh, uh, to spice his food and, and told him he ought to try growing some peppers with it. He did, he was making Tabasco for himself. Um, it was a condiment he originally created to make his own food taste better. But um, as he got back, and let me digress just a minute. The reason the family fled Avery Island during the Civil War is that during the war, um, there had always been the brine springs on Avery Island, and salt was a valuable commodity uh, at that time for preservation of food. Obviously, refrigeration didn't exist. So in 1863, while trying to deepen a brine spring on Avery Island, they actually realized and struck the actual rock salt that is underneath Avery Island. Because salt was a valuable commodity, the Confederate side of the uh, war sent, each state sent in a delegation to start mining salt on Avery Island and hauling it off uh, to use for food preservation. It's actually how we got our road to Avery Island because until that happened, you had to come to Avery Island by boat. But the first thing they did when they got to Avery Island was build a board road, a causeway, an earthen causeway and board road out over the last mile and a half of marsh so that uh, they could haul the salt off of Avery Island on wagons, and that's how we got a road. But um, the family fled the island, and when we got back, or when Edmund and uh, Daniel Avery got back to Avery Island at the end of uh, 1865, um, his diary tells us that he found one of his Tabasco pepper plants at the side of the chicken coop. Edmund lost everything in the war. He was destitute. Um, he lost his banks. He lost his property. He was forced to live in his father-in-law's house at Avery Island because he couldn't support himself or his family. And as he tried to find work, his family encouraged him to bottle the condiment that he was making for himself and try to sell it. So Edmund would bottle uh, crates of Tabasco, take them to New Orleans as he looked for work, and try to sell them. And he was very successful at selling them. So by 1868, he decided it was enough of a commercial success to start the family business. And he created McElhinney Company and started in 1868. Um, this is a copy of Edmund's ledger. And um, because he kept such meticulous records, we know that between 1868 and 1890, when he died, uh, he produced about 360,000 bottles of Tabasco in his lifetime. Um, now we can produce about twice that many bottles every day. When Edmund died in 1890, his eldest son, John McElhinney, took over the company. And um, this is a picture of John in high school, but John actually had been involved with the company prior to uh, uh, coming to work as the president on his father's death because in uh, the 1880s, uh, we had a pepper crop failure, and Edmund sent John into Mexico uh, to try to see if he could locate any Tabasco peppers anywhere that Edmund could buy in order to try to f 
fulfill the orders that he had and was having to turn down because he had, uh, he had a crop failure. And this is a picture of uh, John in Mexico uh, in the 1880s. Um, John took over the company in 1890, but he had had several years of business school uh, before he came to work for us. And uh, he believed very strongly in marketing and trying to, to actively be aggressive about selling the product and getting it into the marketplace. In uh, 1894, um, we had nothing to do with it, but a playwright in Boston created what was then called a burlesque opera called the Burlesque Opera of Tabasco. Now, a burlesque opera in 1890, 1894, 1890 was not a girly show. It was lowbrow uh, comedy with operatic singing. And he produced this, uh, this musical opera uh, that was all about a Mideastern bay who um, hated his food, had a new chef. The chef started putting Tabasco on the Bay's food, and the Bay loved the food, and there were all sorts of subplots and comedy and things that happened from it. And as part of our 150th anniversary, uh, this year in New Orleans in January, we had the New Orleans Opera Company, along with the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra, uh, recreate and do five performances of the Burlesque Opera of Tabasco. And I have to tell you, it was good. We had to rewrite the jokes because 120-year-old jokes aren't funny. And some of it was disjointed, but we hired a playwright and let the playwright modernize it and update it. It sold out. It was very well received. And we think some of the different opera companies around the United States and possibly some of the universities uh, will pick this up uh, and perform it because um, it was extremely well received by the audience. It was, it was kind of nice to see. But um, as part of our agreement, they decided to take this show on the road and go around the country performing the Burlesque Opera at Tabasco. And they asked us to help sponsor it. And we thought it was a great way to promote the product. And um, so we agreed that we would help sponsor it. But as part of that agreement, um, we told them that they had to have people stand at the back of the room at the end of the performance and hand out samples. And from that, we created the eighth ounce mini bottles in 1894 to give away as samples. And we're still doing these today. Um, we'll do, we, I think we did about 30 million of these last year. It's a very popular way uh, for people to use our product. Uh, I actually use them as a business card and put my name on the back. So. But we're still using that after, that's a picture of John. Um, in 1898, John informed the family that he had decided to resign as president because he wished to join Theodore Roosevelt and become a rough rider, which he did. And uh, John was a rough rider. Uh, he worked his way up to being a lieutenant uh, in the rough riders and maintained a friendship, a lifelong friendship uh, with Theodore Roosevelt. He never came back to the company uh, after uh, he left in 1898. This is a picture of John with Theodore uh, when Theodore was campaigning uh, for uh, president. By the way, Theodore didn't like being called Teddy. Everyone called him Teddy, but he hated it. He liked to be called Theodore. Um, this is a copy of some correspondence we had between John and Theodore Roosevelt um, asking John if he could join him in a bear hunt uh, that was being arranged uh, by the Illinois Central Railroad, John did attend this bear hunt. And on this hunt, they had a very difficult time trying to find any bears for the president to shoot. But one of the guides finally found a kind of sickly bear, lassoed it, and tied it to a tree. And then they went and got the president. And any of y'all know Theodore Roosevelt, you know what a sportsman he was. When Theodore saw what was going on, he told him to let the bear go. He'd never kill a bear like that. When the press found out what was going on, they named it Teddy's Bear. And that is where the teddy bear came from. And John was on that hunt with Theodore Roosevelt. Um, when John resigned to, to join uh, Theodore Roosevelt, um, his younger brother, E.A. McElhinney, Edward Avery McElhinney, took over the company. 
And EA will talk about, he actually ran the company from 1898 till 1949. But uh, yeah, 20, 50 years, over 50 years, EA ran the company. But he also was a sort of larger than life person who did a lot of other amazing things. Um, EA loved the outdoors, he loved birds, he loved nature. And he recognized in 1895 that the snowy egret was being hunted to extinction for its feathers for ladies' hats, because the plume of the snowy egret is very beautiful, and they made beautiful uh, plumes in ladies' hats, and they were extremely valuable. So EA went out into the marshes around Avery Island, and he caught um, eight snowy egrets. He built an avery for them. He let them hatch and raise their young, and then he let them go, but at the same time, he established a bird sanctuary at Avery Island in 1895 that's one of the oldest bird sanctuaries in the United States. And from that, hundreds of thousands of egrets started to come back and roost at Avery Island uh, because they were safe and they were not hunted during the nesting season. Um, this is a picture of what we call Bird City. Uh, an egret will only nest over water. They won't nest over land. So we actually build platforms out over the water and um, put bamboo on those platforms and then the egrets will build nests all over the platforms. And starting usually in early February, we begin to see the egrets come in and they're usually with us all the way through uh, mid to late summer. Um, EA didn't stop by just building a place for snowy egrets to, to have a safe harbor. Uh, he also, in 1913, had a film company come in. This was a silent film at the time, by the way. There were no talkies in 1913. But they, they took this film and they brought it to uh, uh, Washington. And any time they could get any legislator to, uh, to listen, they would spool this film up and show it to them. And in 1915, uh, Congress passed an act that protected the snowy egret, which was the first protected bird in the United States. This is a picture of E.A. as a young man at a military academy. Uh, E.A. had an absolute enormous appetite for adventure. Um, he signed on to a polar expedition uh, trying to reach the North Pole. Uh, he was shipwrecked in Newfoundland and that was canceled. But um, he then got a, a commission from the University of Pennsylvania to do a two-year uh, exploratory uh, expedition up to Point Barrow, Alaska. And in the fall of 1897, the whaling fleet had been north of Point Barrow, and they failed to get south before the ice locked in. And 90 plus men were shipwrecked and stranded at Point Barrow, Alaska through the winter of 1897 and 1898, early 1898. Um, EA had an old whaling station that he was using as his headquarters and he cl housed, clothed and fed those 90 sailors uh, through the winter of 1898, saving their lives. And this is a picture of the San Francisco paper uh, in July of 1898. And on the right side, the article refers to uh, the relief expedition that reached the whalers that EA uh, was taking care of. And on the left side, it talks about um, the Spanish uh, War and uh, Cuba and uh, Havana may fall, which was where John McElhinney was with uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. So uh, inadvertently, both brothers uh, and what they were doing was on the front page of the San Francisco paper on the same day. Um, EA, in addition to being very actively involved in um, what he was doing with McElhinney Company, Tabasco, and uh, what he was doing with birds, also did an enormous amount of work with uh, the Department of Agriculture on bamboo cultivation. And um, our records show that with the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture, he imported 64 different varieties of bamboo onto Avery Island to try to cultivate them. 
of which we have the American Bamboo Society comes down and spends time with us every year. Um, we have identified about 24 varieties is still growing on Avery Island. But enormous amount of potential for bamboo, EA thought, although it never materialized into something we were able to use. As they said in the 60 Minutes piece, uh, EA also started jungle gardens. He loved flowers, he loved plants, uh, he loved to cultivate camellias. And uh, he decided that people were buying cars, uh, uh, a lot of cars, and that they wanted things to do with their cars. So he decided to create jungle gardens as a tourist destination to get people uh, to come to Avery Island uh, in the hopes that they'd enjoy the gardens, but also that they would recognize Tabasco and begin to use the products as a sort of cross-marketing technique. Um, some of his friends it, were in New York, and they saw this Buddha statue being sold at auction that had been raided from a temple in China. And um, they liked it, and they thought it would work great in EA's new garden in South Louisiana. So they purchased it, and they sent it to him. And EA was so happy with the Buddha um, that he decided to create, as part of Jungle Gardens, he decided to create an oriental garden inside the garden and built a temple uh, for the Buddha. And it surprises an awful lot of people to come to South Louisiana and find an oriental garden with a Buddha temple in it. Um, we also have a fairly large Buddhist population uh, in the region, and every week, we find offerings left for the Buddha. People leave dollars, they leave coins, they leave change. And every week, we scrape up whatever's been left and we take it to the, uh, uh, the Buddhist uh, community in, in uh, New Iberia and donate it to them because that's where it was supposed to go. Um, EA also was very active in trying to um, conserve wildlife, especially birds. and uh, while he didn't have the money to purchase a lot of property himself, he had a great deal of contacts and knew a great deal of wealthy people. And he convinced uh, the Rockefellers, the Sages, the Wards family uh, to purchase and donate uh, acreage to bird sanctuaries. And EA is credited with getting about 187,000 acres of marshland in South Louisiana dedicated as uh, Wildlife Refuge. This is a picture <laughs> of uh, an idea, a concept EA had. He wanted, to, um, he wanted to expand Tabasco, and he decided to create a product line of uh, seafood dinners, of canned items, of oysters, shrimp, all types of uh, okra and tomatoes. Uh, he invested and he borrowed heavily to put this operation together. Uh, he built a plant for it. Uh, he had a fleet of shrimp boats and oyster luggers to go out and harvest things. It didn't work. Uh, it not only didn't work, um, we almost lost the company to our creditors. Uh, fortunately, we had an Avery family member who uh, was fairly wealthy independently and agreed to lend McElhenney Company the money uh, to pay off our creditors. Uh, that was in the 1920s. It was close to 1950 before we were able to buy our way out of debt and finally get back uh, to a stable environment. It's made my family very adverse to debt, and uh, we have none and carry none and never have. Uh, it limits our ability to grow, but at the same time, uh, the fact that we almost lost the company in the 1920s uh, because of a bad decision by one of our ancestors has had an impact on our ability to do that. That's a picture of the canning operation at Avery Island. Uh, until 1905, every bottle of Tabasco made in the world was made in this building, which is very close to our family home on Avery Island. Uh, we called it the laboratory. But in 1905, EA also invested in a new plant there on Avery Island. Um, we're still using this building now. Uh, it has grown. We've expanded the, uh, the facility itself, but we're still using those facilities. EA also had to deal with another really big problem for us, which was uh, counterfeit 
and um, using our word mark, calling things Tabasco to confuse the public. And he fought for and got a trademark on the right, on the word Tabasco to use on pepper sauce. So as we talked about in that video, no one can call their pepper sauce Tabasco. The only country in the world that doesn't honor our trademark is Costa Rica. And if you go to Costa Rica, you may see four or five different products that say Tabasco, but don't look like our Tabasco bottle. And that's because Costa Rica refused to honor our word mark, and to this day we can't get them to do it. But if anyone in Costa Rica takes a product they're making there and tries to export it to any other country, they get a cease and desist letter very quickly telling them they can't do that. So while we lose market in Costa Rica to it, we don't have to worry about it anywhere else. But there were a lot of knockoffs. Even today, we have one team of attorneys to work on international violations and another team of attorneys that work on domestic violations uh, of our product mark. Um, T-shirts. Uh, the diamond logo with the concentric broken circles is a very well-recognized mark. So obviously, people use it and put their own words in. We spend a lot of time and effort telling them, you can't do that. That's protected. You know, there's a lot of things that we have to do to protect our marks because the courts will tell you, if you don't protect your own mark, why should we do it? Um, a good example of that would be aspirin. Aspirin was actually a proprietary product of the Bayer Pharmaceutical Company. But because they didn't do enough work and enough effort to protect the name to aspirin, from becoming generic, they lost the rights to use the name aspirin. And that's one of our biggest concerns and why we work so hard at it is because obviously the word Tabasco is one of our, one of if not our biggest asset. Um, this is a copy of that trademark letter that we finally got uh, in 1906. Um, when EA died in 1949, he was replaced by Walter McElhenney, and Walter is the son of John McElhenney, the Rough Rider. Walter served in the Second World War in the Marine Corps uh, in the Pacific. Um, he received a Navy Cross, a Silver Star, and two Purple Hearts. He ran the company from 1949 until 1985 when he died. And like his father, Walter was very interested in marketing and new campaigns and ways to uh, expand our business. This is a picture of how we made Tabasco when I was a boy. I remember this in the early 1960s. And we age our pepper mash after we pick the peppers and grind them up into a mash. We age them in oak barrels for up to three years. We say up to three years because what we're looking for is actually two full seasons. We want two hot seasons at Avery Island because the mash actually bubbles and works as we go through um, the process. And we want it to sit through two seasons because it changes the flavor, it changes the color, uh, it makes it a much better product. It's not an alcoholic fermentation, but it is some type of fermentation uh, that works uh, the pepper through those seasons. But when we're ready to use it, the way we did this in the early 60s was the, the man in the back has a full barrel of Tabasco mash that's been aged for three years. And the lady has got eight barrels around it. And she is counting how many scoops he puts in each barrel. And then she goes to barrel to barrel to barrel to make sure it's, even, it's evenly processed between all eight barrels. And then you can see the marks on the side of the barrel where she's got 10, 10 scoops in that barrel, 10, 11 scoops in the barrel on the left. Um, that was how we were doing things. Then we would manually stir with a stick with a flat piece on the bottom of it for up to 28 days. We'd stir the pepper and the vinegar together because that's all there is in the process is Tabasco red pepper and vinegar. And manually stir it for up to 28 days. This is how we do it now with a 2,000 gallon tank. We add a certain amount of Tabasco and up to about 1,900 gallons of vinegar, and then we mix it intermittently for 28 days. It's exactly the same process, except it's being done on a much larger scale. 
after the product had mixed for 28 days, we have to take most of the solids out of the product. Tabasco is such a hot pepper that if we left the kind of solids in Tabasco you see in a, in a, a cayenne-based pepper sauce like, uh, you know, Brand X, um, <laughs> it'd be so hot most people couldn't eat it. So what we have to do is strain most of the seed and skin and, and uh, solids out of the product. We used to do that through a screen back into a barrel by dipping it in and just doing it. That was again in, up to 1963, 64. Now we have high-speed machines that mill those, those additional products out. Almost all of the byproduct that comes out of that product is used uh, for other products. We don't like to throw things away. It's expensive. It's especially good when we can take something we were having to get paid to throw away, we're having to pay to throw away, and turn it into something that we can sell to somebody at a profit. So we use almost everything that comes out of the product. Uh, we're maybe not as quite as good as the pork producers who say they use everything but to squeal, but we come close. <laughs> Walter also faced another problem in that by uh, up until the 1960s, we grew all of our pepper at Avery Island, but our land is not that large and by uh, by the early 1960s, he realized he had no more space on Avery Island to grow peppers. So he expanded and began to grow peppers outside of the country. Uh, Walter is responsible for getting us into Central and South America with our pepper growing operations. And actually, some of our pepper growers now are into their second generation. Walter also, like his father, believed in uh, marketing and in trying to promote product. Um, Tabasco was the first sponsor of the Jack Parr Show on radio. I'm gonna play just a small clip of this, not the whole thing. Hi, this is Jack Parr. As you know, my first sponsor, Tabasco, started on my new radio program, the Jack Parr Show, on August 8th, and will be with me every Wednesday and Thursday morning throughout the important selling season ahead. I'll be selling Tabasco for you over more than 260 high-powered radio stations on the American Broadcasting Company network coast to coast. So, uh, very innovative, very market driven. Um, Walter also built us a new headquarters next to the plant uh, on Avery Island. I can assure you my family would never agree to spend the kind of money to build a building like this again, but we're glad he did it. I'm <laughs> glad I have it. So, but um, when Walter died in, 18, in 1985, uh, he was succeeded by my uncle, uh, Ned Simmons. And the reason I put this picture in is because Ned is posing with our product line uh, in 19, 1990. Um, we had a two ounce bottle of red Tabasco and a 12 ounce bottle of red Tabasco. We, we did have the minis, but that was a small thing. That was all we had up until 1994. And um, we were really a one trick pony all we had was red Tabasco sauce in two sizes. But Ned faced a overloaded factory that couldn't keep up with production, and he had to build a new plant on the north end of Avery Island. Uh, right after he built a new plant, he had to build new warehousing space as well, and enormous investments between uh, 1985 and 1994 uh, in facilities. Uh, this is a picture of our bottling line uh, in the 1920s. And while it was beginning to become automated, it was still a, a lot of labor intensive movement. I especially like the high heels on the lady. I'm sure you'd see that in a plant today. So, um, this is a picture of what our facilities look like now. Obviously high speed, uh, much more modern facilities uh, with four bottling lines plus an offline uh, system uh, that Ned put in place. And as we said, uh, we have the capability to produce about 720,000 bottles of Tabasco a day. So um, Ned resigned as president in uh, 1998. And when Ned resigned as president in 98, my cousin Paul McElhinney took over. Um, Paul was a very innovative man. He absolutely loved food. Uh, he loved to innovate and to create new things to do with Tabasco. And he also, like uh, his cousin Walter, uh, believed very much uh, in marketing 
and, and mass marketing. This is a 1998 Super Bowl commercial we ran. Uh, it was given a very high rating in 1998. It was voted like one of the five best Super Bowl commercials that ran that year. You know, the problem with Super Bowl commercials is it's during a party usually, and there's so much noise that your commercials almost have to be nonverbal because there's so much noise going on at so many parties. If it relies on being able to hear, a whole lot of it is not going to be able to happen. So it was a, very much a nonverbal uh, opportunity for us, and it worked very well. Um, Paul also was responsible for reaching out and getting us a royal warrant because Queen Elizabeth is actually a very big fan of Tabasco, and he got a royal warrant stating that by appointment by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, we are the official supplier of Tabasco sauce, McElhinney Company, to the, uh, to the royal family. This is actually a, is given to the individual. So this royal warrant was actually issued to Paul uh, when Paul died 19, in 2013, I had to write to the Royal Warrant Holders Association and ask if they were willing to, to transfer um, the, the warrant to my name uh, since Paul had died, which they did and agreed to do. But he was very proud of it. Um, Paul also uh, led our efforts to expand it, even while Ned was still alive and running the company. Uh, and Paul began to aggressively uh, expand our product offerings by adding a green sauce, a chipotle sauce, uh, a habanero sauce, a garlic sauce, a sweet and spicy sauce. Now we have a sriracha. Uh, we have a scorpion sauce. Our scorpion sauce is about anywhere from 10 to 20 times as hot as regular red Tabasco. Uh, but Paul did a lot of work to expand it. Um, he also worked aggressively to co-brand our products. and. Uh, these are some of the more successful co-brands we've had. Uh, A1 Bold and Spicy Steak Sauce with Tabasco. Uh, hot and Spicy Spam. The Hot and Spicy Spam actually originally came out for Guam because if the rest of the world consumed Tabasco at the same rate that the Guamese do, I don't think we could make enough Tabasco. It's unbelievable. I don't know what they do. They must put it in the baby's milk or something because they consume an enormous amount of Tabasco. Per capita, they're the highest consumer of Tabasco in the world. Outside of the United States for one company, or one country, Japan. Japan uses a huge amount of Tabasco, uh, mainly on pasta and pizza, but they consume quite a bit of it. But Paul actively and very aggressively uh, increased our efforts here. Um, Paul also redid our compensation system for our employee group uh, as family businesses. Uh, if your stock is held by the family and in our case, it's a blood stock. You must be a family member to own it or a spouse of a family member. Uh, how do you motivate employees? How do you compensate? And Paul switched us over in 2000 to something called EVA, which is EVA stands for Economic Value Added. Uh, it's a value-based management system. And after we take a break, uh, I'll talk some about EVA and our compensation system that we use uh, to incentivize our employees. Um, when Paul took over from my uncle and my uncle retired, Paul was the only family member left in the business. Uh, I was in the heavy equipment business. Uh, my cousin Harold Osborne uh, was a consultant in, in D.C., uh, primarily on environmental matters. And uh, Paul reached out to me in 1999, and he reached out to my cousin Harold, and he said, you know, I had just sold my business in 99. He said, Tony, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, be a consultant. You know? He said, well, if you want to work, why don't you come back to work for your family? So in 2000, the start of 2000, I moved back uh, to work for my family and took started about the same time. Uh, I spent 12 years as Paul's understudy um, as executive vice president of the company. Uh, and then in 2012, they made me president and COO. And in 2013, 
in February, Paul died unexpectedly and I became the CEO. But that makes me the fifth generation of my family and the seventh family member to run our family business. And I also, as I said, run Avery Island Inc. for us, which is seventh generation and is ninth generation of shareholders. So um, after we take a, a well, before that, um, I'm going to run a little long here, and then we'll take a break, and I'll run a little less after the break. But um, this is Hurricane Katrina, the Superdome in New Orleans in 2005. Everybody remembers Katrina and how bad it was uh, during Katrina. But what people don't remember is that two weeks after Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Rita hit the western part of our state. And this is a picture of the only road off Avery Island looking to the north. And that's what it looked like after Hurricane Rita got to us. Uh, we were cut off for four days. Um, we had eight feet, two inches of water at Avery Island. The plant floor was eight feet, six inches high. So we were within four inches of having uh, flood water in the food plant. So we built our own levee around the north end of Avery Island uh, in order to protect the plant. And we now protected the plant up to 18 feet, six inches. Uh, and we don't think that there is an event uh, they could put water over an 18-foot, 6-inch levee uh, at Avery Island. So uh, in addition to doing that, uh, we've also uh, spent about $6.5 million on our visitor center at Avery Island. We get about 120,000 tourists a year uh, that come out to see uh, Jungle Gardens and Avery Island. Uh, we added a restaurant in order to be able to feed our, uh, our visitors. Uh, and it's been a very successful uh, expansion for us. Uh, up until we built the new center, we actually didn't charge, we didn't charge for tours of Tabasco. Um, we actually found that once we began charging for tours of the plant, things went up. So surprising, but you never know. Um, that's pretty much the history of my family and our family business. And we'll take a break, and then when we come back, uh, I'll talk to you about um, how we run our family business, the nuts and bolts of, of what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. And uh, in some ways, we're kind of a unicorn in that uh, we're family owned, we're family operated, and I have an all family board, and it's a fifth generation going to a sixth generation business. So let's take a break, and then we'll talk about the nuts and bolts of our family business. Thanks. So I think about the, uh, uh, the presentation I guess just uh, gave to you is the fun part. That's, uh, that's the part about the history of the family and the uh, history of the company. Um, the things we've done and the men uh, who've done it uh, as my ancestors. Um, but family businesses face unique challenges because uh, you know, as all of y'all know, um, a family business usually starts with somebody being a successful entrepreneur. And that successful entrepreneur has to figure out how to transfer that business, if you're going to keep it as a family business, uh, to a second generation. And not every second generation is interested in the family business. So there's all sorts of ways for a family business to come apart trying to move from a successful entrepreneur uh, to some sort of a um, sibling partnership uh, among the children. Do you work in the business? Do you not work in the business? If you have multiple children, um, if you're not going to work in the business, do you get to share in the benefit of the business? Uh, if, if you're going to work in the business, do you get the stock and the people that don't, don't get the stock? There's all sorts of ways uh, for that family business to blow up moving from a successful entrepreneur to a, uh, to a sibling partnership. And then if you do manage to make it through the second generation and uh, the, the children can get along and they've worked out their issues, uh, then you're going to try to move uh, a family business to the third generation. It's probably going to have to be some sort of cousin consortium. And there again, the whole thing can come apart again. Um, there's lots of minds out there that a company can step on, a family business can step on. Uh, that'll blow it up. Um, you know, if you starve the family for the business, 
then you may have a very large asset that produces no benefit to a significant number of the shareholders. And if you do that, what happens? The shareholder wants liquidity. The family business probably can't afford to give that shareholder liquidity without selling the family business. So you can't starve the family member for the business, and you can't starve the business for the family member, because if you starve the business for the family member, then the, fa then the business will shrivel and die. So you've got to try to strike a balance that makes your family happy with um, what they receive from owning a family business against what the business needs to be a successful business. And that's not an easy balance to make, and it can uh, create opportunities for the family to be forced to sell a business. There's lots of issues. Uh, once you get past the third generation, if you've created a correct structure, and you've, you've actually got the pieces in place, then maybe it becomes a little easier uh, to begin to do, uh, to treat your family business more like a public company and an investment in a public company. And as a fifth generation family business and a seventh generation family business, uh, that's pretty much where we are. Uh, we encourage our shareholders uh, to think about their investment in McElhinney Company, it's a stock company, uh, as just that, an investment. And fortunately, our stock is diverse enough now, uh, spread out among about 130 shareholders for McElhinney Company, that um, no one family member uh, could force us to sell a company. If someone wants liquidity, we will be more than happy to write them a check. Uh, in addition to that, I have an enormous number of family members uh, who would be more than happy to get more stock and would be happy to write a check. So. Uh, so we're over that hump, but that doesn't mean that at some point in the future uh, we could receive an offer that's so large uh, that the family would decide to sell the company. I don't know that they would, uh, but it's always a, a question mark. So what I was going to spend some time doing, and then uh, I'll take questions, uh, at, we'll leave a lot of time for questions and answers, uh, is talk about our structure and our processes uh, and how we run our family business. First, uh, we're an S-Corp. Uh, we were a C-Corp, but in 2005, Congress changed the law that's because we couldn't fit under the number of shareholder regulation that S-Corps had at that time. And in 2005, Congress changed the law and said, for purposes of determining how many uh, shareholders an S-Corporation has, uh, you can count back six generations to a common ancestor and their spouses and count that as one shareholder. So all of a sudden we were able to become an S-Corp. Uh, being an S-Corp has been a very good uh, thing for us. We've saved quite a bit of, of money in taxes uh, as an S-Corp. This last tax law change has made uh, significant differences. Uh, in, one of the other things I do besides running two family businesses is I am chairman of the S-Corp Association, which is an advocacy group in Washington, D.C., uh, that works uh, to um, uh, inform legislatures, legislators of what tax law changes and the things they're doing and how it affects uh, S-Corps especially, but also family businesses. Um, only 6% of the businesses in the United States are formed as C-Corps. Now, admittedly, they're huge, and they're a large part of our economy, but 94% of business in the United States is either uh, sole proprietorships, LLCs, S-Corps, uh, or partnerships of some sort. They're, they're not C-Corps. So uh, S-Corp tends to advocate for an awful lot of businesses that aren't necessarily S-Corps, but a lot of times uh, it, they're uh, they're pass-through entities, and we do a lot of work for pass-throughs. But uh, being an S-Corp has been beneficial to us. Um, we're a stock corporation. You do not receive stock just because you're a family member. Um, you receive stock from your, uh, most likely from your parents. So I received uh, my shares of stock from my father, uh, and I'll pass them down to my children. And in most family businesses, um, actually, the higher the valuation of the stock, uh, the worse it is because um, the valuation is going to determine the uh, estate tax 
that the family is going to have to pay. Um, and uh, for family business, the estate tax can be a killer. Uh, you know, every, every generation, and they estimate generations at 25 years, but every generation you were, until the recent tax law changes, you were paying 55% of the value of a corporation uh, to the federal government every year to keep, or every generation to keep your family business. So um, we have fixed the shares, uh, number of shares uh, is fixed, and it's almost all done through inheritance and passing it on uh, to the children. Um, it's, uh, it's something we encourage our family members to work hard at with their estate planning uh, to make sure that they don't leave uh, the next generation with a very large tax bill and no way to pay it. Um, we have a very strong corporate governance system. It's extremely strong. Um, I'm the CEO, but I have a board of directors uh, that is all family, and they are extremely engaged. Not only are they engaged, but my family's engaged. Uh, I have about 130, as I said, family shareholders who own the business along with me. Um, we have 10 members of our board of directors. Um, the president is the CEO, but we have an independent um, chairman who's non-executive um, to try to split the duties and the chairman runs the board and I run the company. Um, we think that's best practice, although there may be some uh, argument about that. Um, we currently, this slide is a little old, we actually have four family members now actively involved in the business. Our history is only to have between two and four family members involved in the business at any given time. It's a different model than an awful lot of family businesses, but it's worked for us. Um, if we hire a family member to come into the business, we hire a family member with the anticipation that they will one day run the business. They work for another family member. That family member that they work for is charged with not only mentoring them, but also making a decision as to whether or not they're capable of continuing to accept additional responsibilities. Because when you take the job with us as a family member, you take the job with the caveat that you're going to be judged, and if the family member that's judging you determines that you're not capable of taking the next step, then you're going to be asked to leave. You can't stay. We can't afford to fill the ranks of our middle and senior management team with family members who may be competent but can't move up. We think we need the best we can get to be a good successful business. And um, we want family to run our business, but we want the best we can get helping that family member run the business. It has happened. We have had to ask uh, family members to leave. It's not pleasant. Um, but this is a business, it's our family business, and we need to make sure it's successful. Um, so, currently, I work for the company. My cousin Took, y'all saw her in the business, in the video, works for the company. And um, my son was actually hired by Took to come into the company, and he's 38. And then we just hired another young family member to come into the business who is uh, 27 and um, we have I'm actually supposed to retire in June took will take over the company and my son's 38 and we have another young family member who's 27 but we have a succession program in place of how we intend uh, to bring family members into our business um, by the time they would look at taking over the business we'd like them to have uh, 20 years of experience or so, uh, running our family, being involved in our family business uh, before, uh, before they take the helm. Um, we invite three young family members to do what we call an associate board uh, seat, where we, we reach out and look at our young family cousins and uh, take the ones we think that have the potential to possibly be either involved in the business or involved at the board level. 
and we invite them to come into the board meetings and attend the board meetings and participate in the board meetings. Uh, and it gives them an opportunity to see how their family business is run. And it gives us an opportunity to actually interview potential board candidates for the future. And <clears throat> that is the way um, uh, we select candidates. Um, one of the things I told you I think we're a unicorn in is that uh, we're family owned and operated, but we're also a family board of 10. And one of the ongoing discussions we have continuously in the boardroom is should we have outside directors? Isn't it best practice to have outside directors? Yes, it is. But um, the last two directors we put on the board um, are both young family members. Uh, they're both in their early 40s. Um, one graduated from Stanford with a degree in chemical engineering and went on to get his, his uh, PhD in chemical engineering uh, from Berkeley. Then he went to work for Bain and Company and he was a full partner at Bain and Company when we hired him uh, or we put him on the board. And now he's working for a, uh, a software firm uh, in Texas, but an extremely smart man, very bright, uh, very well qualified to serve on the board. The other young family member that we put on our board graduated from Harvard, uh, worked for McKinsey and Company for a while, uh, went back to Harvard Law and graduated second in the class, worked for DOJ for a while, worked for Verizon for a while, and now she is the co-president of the Brady Center on Gun Violence. She's a very bright lady. So with family members like that to draw on for board experience, we haven't felt that we were missing as much uh, in the non-family director uh, mode. I think uh, for my directors, um, the area that they would like to see some expertise possibly add onto the board uh, would be someone in the consumer packaged goods industry as an outside director that knows the business because my family directors admit they're not in the food business every day. They're not in the consumer packaged goods business every day. And that makes them a little uneasy as to whether or not they can judge me as a CEO as well as they possibly should. But uh, it's very, uh, believe me, they are very involved. Um, we invite our high school and college age uh, cousins to come work for us at Avery Island. And we give them the worst jobs in the place. <laughs> we absolutely give them the worst jobs in the place. Um, we have some we call our three-time losers. And those are the ones that actually come back for multiple summers. Uh, the ones that come back for multiple summers are probably the ones that have the highest opportunity uh, to ever go to work for the company. Um, the ones who show up and think they're to the manor born uh, usually don't last the whole summer. Um, if you actually complete the first summer, then we'll actually ask you what it is that you'd like to do for us if you're coming back for additional summers. So if there's certain areas, uh, whether it's agriculture or marketing or sales uh, that they're interested in, uh, we'll actually let them start to pick the type of work they want to do for us in the summer uh, if they come back a second time. And uh, the, the youngest family member we just hired at 27, he did four summers at Avery Island. He impressed all of us. Uh, he's a real good fit uh, as a young family member coming in. His onboarding for us, by the way, will be about 16 months before he does anything uh, in a capacity. We put him through every uh, part of our business. Uh, we'll send him overseas for a month uh, with one of our distributors to work in a foreign market. Uh, we'll put him with one of our food service distributors for a month and let him work at seeing how our food service uh, is sold. We'll do the same thing with retail, and we put him through every department in the company. Um, our boards, we have an audit, a corporate governance and, fin and a nominating committee, a finance committee, and a comp committee. Every one of them meets quarterly. Uh, every one of them has a formal written charter, and uh, we have a very... Uh, uh, robust uh, board system and, and uh, committee system uh, to manage our business 
and it's worked very well. Communication. Um, my family is spread out all over the world now, and we have to try to communicate with them and try to keep them actively involved with uh, their family business and want them to continue to own their family business. So we do a quarterly shareholder letter, uh, which includes copies of our, our internal uh, newsletter. Uh, we have an annual shareholders meeting at Avery Island, and I usually get over 75% of my shareholders will attend uh, the annual meeting and come. It may have something to do with we serve a really nice lunch after it, but with Bloody Marys. But, um, I am always available to a shareholder uh, to discuss their family business with them, whatever it is on their mind. And my assistant is our primary contact to our shareholder group uh, because that way, if she senses there's an unhappiness or a dispute or, a, you know, uh, a family member who's disgruntled about whatever it is, uh, she has instant access to me so that I can begin to handle it. Um, we use a restricted where, uh, website for our shareholders because so many of my shareholders are younger and would prefer to get their information electronically, and it's worked pretty well, but we also restrict access. Uh, we monitor the IP addresses that come into it. And then I maintain an email uh, list that I can send a blast email to all of my shareholders, but no one gets the list just because I've sent them, uh, you know, an email. But I can reach out to my shareholders and, in, and communicate with them instantly. We do a family outreach program. Um, we invite 20 to 25 family members to come in for a three-day intensive Tabasco 101. And um, we spend, they spend time with every one of our senior people, a significant amount of time. We also do it in conjunction with our quarterly board meeting. So all the board members are there, and the board members interact with them um, in, in, uh, at lunches and dinners, uh, and then they also interact with the officers and the officer's spouses during lunches and dinners, as well as individual sessions uh, with each department over what that department does, how they do it, and why. And the length of time is all based on the department. Um, I started out by having our IT department do two hours, uh, our feedback after the first one was cut it. I cut it to an hour. The feedback was cut it. <laughs> I cut it to 30 minutes, and I'm still being asked to cut it. So obviously, IT is not as interesting to my shareholders as marketing or sales or production. But um, they, do, uh, they do work with each of the different groups and the sessions. Um, we also, as I mentioned, we have a full-time historian uh, an archivist who works for us, Dr. Shane Bernard, and uh, they spend quite a bit of time with Dr. Bernard uh, talking about the history of the company and anything they'd like to know about what we do uh, and how we do it. Um, as I said, we do it uh, in conjunction with the board meetings uh, because we want them to interact uh, with the board as well. Um, we've put about, because we open this to spouses as well as uh, uh, shareholders. Um, we've done four of these now, about a hundred people uh, have come in and done it. Uh, it's been very well received by my family. Um, they uh, become more engaged with their family business because they feel they know more about their family business now and uh, it's been effective at keeping our family connected to Avery Island. Between asking our young people to come out and work for us in the summer our annual shareholders meeting, and now our uh, family outreach program. Uh, it's been a very effective way for us uh, to try to inform family members and to keep things uh, from becoming uh, disjointed where people say, I'd rather have liquidity, I don't want to own this family business anymore. So, One of the things we do at the end is we hire an outside business consultant, in our case he's from Tulane uh, in New Orleans, which is very close to us. And the, the final day of the program, that uh, family business consultant comes in and he uses a program that essentially is how to be an effective shareholder 
in a family business that you're not a part of other than a shareholder. And he talks about the do's and the don'ts of, uh, you know, etiquette. And a simple example would be a lot of my family members, I have three and four generation uh, employees. A lot of my family members know a lot of my employees. So they'll pick up the phone and call that employee and ask them for something. And we continually reinforce to them, please don't do that. You put the employee in a very bad situation. Anything you need, you need to come through me or my cousin Took and ask us for it because the employee is not authorized to do something for you just because you're a family member. And those are the type of things we try to emphasize uh, in the program. Uh, also, by using an outside consultant, some of my family feels more comfortable with, um, they feel more comfortable with opening up about uh, questions they may not be willing to ask the management team uh, or the board members. So uh, we found that to be a very effective way uh, to keep the lines of communication open uh, and, and keep our younger family members uh, actively engaged with our company since they're from you know, all over the United States, Canada. Uh, I have cousins who live in South Africa. Uh, after you know, five generations, we're moving around the world and it's, uh, uh, it's an effective way to help take care of it. Board communication. Um, like, as I said, we have a very active board. Um, I have to prepare a business plan and present it to the board in October, and I am not allowed to implement any of the parts of that business plan uh, until the board uh, approves uh, the business plan going forward. Uh, in addition to doing an annual business plan, we do a five-year plan. Um, you know, uh, I always put a disclaimer at the front of the a five-year plan that comes from Winston Churchill, uh, who in the darkest days of the Battle of Britain said, it is a mistake to peer too far, in, too far into the future. Uh, the chain of destiny can only be grasped one link at a time. And I do that to remind uh, my board members that trying to outguess five years uh, is a, a fool's errand and it's pretty hard to do. What it does do is it makes every one of my managers have to recognize I need to think about what I'm going to be needing five years from now and be us having a good opportunity uh, to at least be able to go back and look at, at these plans over time and say, here's where we thought we were going to be, here's where we are, here's how that measures up against what we said. Are we ahead or behind? Um, my board receives detailed financial statements monthly and they get sales by region and product for the month year to date, as well against prior year and plan. So they'll have three different columns on those financial statements. Here's what we said we were gonna do, here's what we did last year, and here's what our actual numbers are. So you can measure us against uh, both what we thought we could do and against what we did last year. Um, we do a detailed cash flow summary as well, and then we do quarterly board meetings. Uh, we have four meetings a year. Uh, and that seems to be about right for us. Uh, during those meetings, uh, I present a scorecard to the board that's based on the initiatives and objectives that the management team set in its business plan when we presented it in October. So we set out a set of goals and initiatives that we have for ourselves for uh, the coming year. And we use what I call a stoplight, uh, red, yellow, and green to evaluate it. Red would be, we're not achieving the goal. Yellow would be, we're above last year, but we're not to the plan we are this year, or it's very close, but it's not there yet. And then green would be those things that uh, we are doing, we've done them, and, and we either are at or above uh, where we said we would be, and also what we were last year. So um, that review, works very well for us and um, our board meetings uh, usually are in conjunction with uh, the um, uh, in conjunction with the committee meetings normally we do committee meetings all morning 
And then we do board meetings all afternoon, or the board meeting all afternoon. And uh, we have been able to successfully uh, navigate five generations of family uh, by making sure that uh, we interact with the family, uh, that we're transparent. Uh, sunlight is an amazing disinfectant. Um, I don't know if any of you have faced it, but you know, I'll get word that one of my cousins has made a comment. So-and-so says we keep two sets of books. And I'll get on the phone with them, you know. What is this I hear that you think we have two sets of books? We do have two sets of books. We have EVA, which we talk about, and how we calculate those uh, things. And then we have gap accounting and what the gap accounting has to be in the tax work. So there are two sets of books, but it's not some mysterious hoodoo or a conspiracy to cheat the shareholder. It is all doing with what we do. And that's the, the last thing I'll talk about uh, before we take questions is uh, EVA. As a family business, uh, all of us face the issue of how do you compensate employees unless you go to an ESOP, uh, which we, someone talked about earlier. Um, you can do phantom share plans, uh, you can do things, but we were trying to find a, a system that would align the, uh, the employee and the shareholder in one unit. And we think we found it uh, under EVA. Um, basic EVA would work on the concept of if you own shares in a company, you should expect a return on your investment. So we measure under EVA the capital that's being used, your capital if you're the shareholder. And in simplified EVA, let's say the company was using a million dollars worth of the shareholder's capital. That's what, that's what the investment is. Um, that's what the capital is. You establish a benchmark that the, the company has to return in order to provide value for the shareholder. In our case, we use a very simplified system. It's 1% per month. It's 12% a year. So under simplified EVA, you measure the net operating profit after tax. If that net operating profit after tax is 12% of the capital, your EVA is essentially zero. You're not hurting the, 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 the investment, but you're not improving the investment of the company. If the net operating profit after tax is more than $120,000 a year, then you're actually adding value to the share. You're actually adding value to, to the company. Any positive EVA gets shared with the employees. And we do it all the way through down. All of our employees are in our EVA system. The percentage of bonus that you receive changes the higher you get in the company. But bonus structure and incentive pay is all based on economic value added, which is actually based on year to year. Because whatever it is this year, it automatically goes up the next year. So it automatically ratchets up. You end up having to pay for EVA as an employee. In It shows up as a cost. So you have to charge that against earnings, net operating profit after taxes. But it's open-ended. The bonus can be huge. But the bonus is only huge if the earnings are huge and the value that's added to the shareholder is much larger. The other thing that happens is that that value, that increase in the value continues to accrue to the benefit of the shareholder where the employee has got to earn it every year. What did you do for me lately? So um, we have to earn our bonus every year. The higher you are in the company, uh, the more pay is at risk. And in my case as a CEO, uh, about 60% of my potential earnings are all incentive based. That drops to an employee at the hourly level, um, their bonus structure would be 12% uh, of their pay. Of it, 6% is uh, by objective. 
with their management team, and the other 6% uh, is uh, EVA-based, and it's all based on the performance of the company. Because it's based on capital, it makes employees think like owners. Because when an owner looks at, do I need this? Should I buy this? Should I invest in this? What they're worried about is how much is it going to make me? Is this a good investment for me? And is my business going to be a better business and make more profit because I've invested this million dollars in this fancy new machine? Now, your management team has to pay for that investment. They're charged 12% a year on the capital that's being used to run the company. So it forces an employee to think like an owner in the sense of my bonus is going to be impacted by what I spend. Do I really need it? Should I buy it? Should I make a recommendation to the management and the board that we invest in this fancy, new, glittery, pretty thing that I think would make my life simple? So it's worked very well. We, we instituted it in 2000. Um, from 2000 to 2010, we doubled the revenues of the company, and we're still using the same amount of capital that we were using in 2000. So, uh, I think that's a testament to how well it no, doesn't necessarily work for everybody, but it does work for us. And with that, um, I'll leave some time to, to answer questions, but I believe we had an announcement before we take questions. Well, first of all, Let's give Tony a round of applause. Thank you for coming. There we go. Um, the big announcement is just don't forget to do your evaluations. Uh, sometimes I forget it at the end, and Lisa gets angry at me, so I don't like Lisa angry at me. So uh, in case I forget to tell you before we go, uh, you have valuations on your table. We do take those very seriously. And uh, again, thank you, Tony, for taking time out of your busy schedule to come here and talk to us. So with that, let's turn it over to questions. I'm sure we got a lot of good food for thought there. And uh, while we have Tony here, it'd be a great opportunity to uh, pursue some of those comments he's made a little further. So anybody have a question? Jim. Uh, just uh, from a family member standpoint, you talk about two or three family members, is that just in management level? Or are there family members that might want to do something in HR or marketing that are still part of the company but just not considered for management? No. No, we don't hire family. Um, my family, my cousins, my young cousins will come to us and tell us, you know, Tony, I, I think I'd like to work for my family business. And um, we tell them all the same thing. We know you're interested because you've told us. If we're interested, we'll reach out. But if we're not going to put you in a training program because we believe that you are going to one day run the company, then we don't hire family. It's much easier to get a job with us as you, if you're not a family member. And uh, we have an enormous number of families who have worked with us three, four, and sometimes five generations, like Coy Booty, who you saw in the 60-minute uh, um, presentation. Does that answer your question? It's, it's different. We, we're different. I mean, we're kind of a unicorn in some ways. You know, we don't have any outside directors. The family still runs the business as opposed to having outside management, which you see in a you know, you don't see many third and fourth generation businesses that the family still runs. You know, you don't see many board of directors in a third, fourth, fifth generation family business that are all family without outside directors. You know, so. It works for us. Doesn't necessarily mean it'll work for anybody else. As we talked about earlier, you know, the different ways to blow up a family business at every level, every generation are enormous. You know, um, and, you know, we need all the money to put back in the company. Well, I have an asset worth all of this money, and I'm a pauper. 
Why should I do that? You know, why do I want to keep this, this stock in this family? Just so that I can say I'm a member of the family? And that balance, you know, has a, a big bearing. Just a, a point of clarity, all of your board members are family members, is that correct? Some of them are spouses. Okay, but they're, they're part of the family. They are part of the family. And they're stockholders. And they're stockholders. And I don't know if you'll answer this question or not, but how many, how many issues of stock are there for 130 people? There's, Just out of curiosity. Only, because we're an S-Corp, there's only one class of stock. And under an S-Corp, under the rules of S-Corp, um, every shareholder must receive the same amount uh, when you do distributions. And, and so, um, you know, we make tax distributions and then we make income distributions out for shareholder, uh, to the shareholders from our S-Corp. Uh, but every shareholder exceed, has to receive under S-Corp rules exactly the same, you know, even if their tax rate is much lower, you know. And we assume the maximum tax rate for state and uh, federal tax. Uh, and Louisiana state income tax is 6%. So we're distributing about 46% of earnings as uh, tax distribution. Uh, and then we do uh, income distribution as well. But I'm assuming that there's different numbers, like you might have more, lap, more stock than another family member. Is that correct or not? Yes. So, I mean, can you, can you say like you have 4,000 shares of stock outstanding for 130 people, or is that not relevant for what you're doing? It's not really relevant. I mean, um, you know, the only reason we, uh, uh, you know, we established the total number of shares, um, but we have a significant number of shares that are not issued, but they won't be issued. There are no stock incentives for, say, me as president, um, my family is very jealous of the number of shares and does not want to see any other shares uh, issued uh, to dilute their holding. And um, I do end up with shareholders who have no heirs and who let us know that they intend to leave their shares to a non-qualified party, knowing that we're not going to allow that. So my cousin Walter McElhenney, who, wrote, who ran the company from... Uh, 1949 to 1985, um, Walter left all, he left all of his shares of stock to the Marine Military Academy in Harlingen, Texas. He, we knew what he was going to do, and he knew uh, that we were not going to allow MMA to own the shares. When he died and the will was uh, probated, um, we wrote a check to Marine Military Academy for Walter's shares. And then we put them in his treasury stock, and, and the shares don't, you know, they'll sit there in perpetuity. So if we have a large, if we have any shareholder who wishes their shares to go to a particular um, uh, entity, uh, you know, we'll work with them to make sure that entity receives the benefit, but they can't own the shares. So one of the questions that we talked about at our table is certainly if uh, it's that you're at the CEO level and the president's le at the pr at the senior level is going to be a family member, and I understand the EVA program, but do you find it difficult to hire uh, top executive talent with the understanding that there's a ceiling there um, within the organization? It's a good question, and. Um a lot of our talent comes uh, internally. Um, we use a system, not at the senior level, but at the, at, uh, up to the manager level, uh, we use a system where we post internally for all openings. And we create a, uh, group of five people to do an interview of any employees who post to be promoted. That group consists of three people who would actually have to work for that person in that environment, the manager, 
and the HR person. They interview any employees that um, uh, post for the job. The three people that actually have to work with that person and for that person vote first. If they are unanimous about one of the candidates, the HR and the manager don't get a vote. That person gets the job. Our people know that, and they know that um, you're going to have an opportunity to be promoted internally before anybody else gets a chance at the job. So most of our openings are at the bottom rung because if a person is a, uh, you know, a mechanic on the line and they post to become a line uh, uh, supervisor and they get the job, then I have an opening for a mechanic and then we're going to post at the lower level for that and it'll probably move somebody up. So most of my openings are at the, the base. My employees really like that system a lot. A lot of our senior team comes from people who've worked for us uh, 20, 30 years and have moved up through the ranks and gone through different departments in the company. Um, I think they recognize that the family wants a family member to run the business um, and that they are not going to be the CEO. But I, we do spend quite a bit of time making sure that we get accurate information on what the compensation should be for our senior executives and make sure that we're competitive so that they are being compensated at a level uh, that's competitive in our industry and in our area. But I don't think it's hurt us in terms of uh, uh, being able to attract the talent. We've seen maybe part of that is being a 150-year-old family business. Um, you know, a lot of our senior management team are people, if they're coming from the outside, which is rare, but if they're coming from the outside, a lot of our people are people who are sick of working for companies that are being bought by uh, uh, investment banking firms and, and people that want to monetize it. Uh, you know, anybody in the food business knows how much turmoil there's been at Kraft Heinz and how many people have been let go there. A lot of good people on the street uh, in the consumer packaged goods world. So. Is that it? Right. I I think you said that you switched to a sub S in 2005. Actually, we, we, we didn't switch until 2009. My family doesn't do anything in a hurry. Okay. Trust me. Okay, with, with the Except large, call me if their dividend isn't in the bank at 8 in the morning. With, with the large number of stockholders that you have, how do you go about explaining that and educating them about becoming a sub S? That, that's a real good question, and it took quite a bit of education. Uh, we held sessions for anybody who wanted uh, to do it, and um, we talked to them extensively. Uh, as part of that process as well, we also created a shareholder agreement. And part of the shareholder agreement we created, which binds the shares and their assigns in perpetuity, was that each year we'll have a valuation made on the shares, and those, that valuation will include a discount uh, for uh, lack of marketability and, a, and uh, a minority interest in a closely held company. And those, those discounts will be factored in to that valuation, and that valuation creates a call price. So if my cousin decides to leave stock to a non-qualified party, the board refuses to, to issue the shares, and the call price governs how much we're going to pay to whoever is going to get the, uh, uh, you know, the cash settlement. So that there is no argument about over what the valuation of the stock is if a shareholder wants liquidity. So it's very rare for any of my shareholders to want liquidity. Uh, most of them would prefer to, have, prefer to have more stock. And if a family member does want some liquidity and they want to sell a few shares to another family member, they're welcome to do so and they can change those shares between them at any price they want to change them, but the corporation would only purchase shares at the call price and has the right to do so. So, okay. 
Yeah. No. Um, the the different the different shares are being divided based on uh, family. So, uh, in my case, I have seven siblings. Uh, so my my father's shares were divided among uh, eight of us. Um, in the case of my cousin Ned, who ran the company, he had four children. So. His shares were divided among his four children, uh, where mine were, you know, my father's were divided among eight. So uh, I have uh, cousins who have no heirs, you know. Uh, I have fourth generation cousins, I'm in the fifth generation. I have fourth generation cousins uh, who just now are beginning to do estate planning and have fairly large uh, numbers of shares. Nothing that could ever force us uh, to sell a company, but. Uh, it could force us to, to make a significant cash outlay to take their shares out. I have a question. Um, so you inherited the Tabasco brand and the legacy that came with it. How did you, I think you said you spent 12 years with the, your predecessor um, in like a mentor relationship. How did you identify what you needed to keep to keep the legacy of the business going on and how did you identify what you needed to change to evolve with like the market and just the changing environment? So similar to the way a doctor works, my philosophy is first do no harm. Uh, I have a family business that's five generations old and that my family likes to have. Um, so I approach my decisions uh, from the uh, standpoint of, you know, what's the long-term effect that this will have uh, on this company and this business. At the same time, um, as I talked about uh, when I first started, um, marketing's changing at the speed of light. Uh, you know, I've got 26 and 27-year-old uh, uh, employees telling me how I need to spend 10 and $12 million in advertising funds. And I'm listening to them, you know? So um, it's, there's a constant uh, tension in, in how you continue to uh, spend your money to, uh, to increase uh, sales and performance. And uh, it's, you, you, nobody's ever gonna get it all right. But uh, we, we work hard at trying to make sure that we're doing things that add value and that we don't do things that will diminish the brand. And um, try to come up with ways to make sure we know what's going on in our marketplace and that we're addressing those needs. And when I talked about my Uncle Ned sitting next to our product line, which was a 12-ounce bo bottle and a 2-ounce bottle, that was in 1990. Um, you know, we now have uh, a much more diverse spread because our uh, attitude and usage studies that we do with consumers, uh, when we used to do them, they used to say, yeah, I have a bottle of Tabasco and I do, I would never make a Bloody Mary without it. Or I like to have it on my eggs. Or I have a bottle of Brand X and I use it for this. When we talk to consumers now, they'll say, well, I have five different hot sauces in my, in my cupboard. And when I, I, yeah, I have Tabasco, and when I make this dish and I make a Bloody Mary, I use Tabasco. But you know, when I make this dish or this dish or this type of food, I'm using this because this is a better flavor profile or a better heat level for that food. The consumers become much more sophisticated in how they use hot sauce. Not only that, but young people want to use something that they think is cool or different or new. So, are you using that? No. Oh, no. This is the new thing, you know. This is the hot thing right here. So, you're always having to try to reinvent yourself with young people and try to make sure that they recognize the value that you have, and it's tough to do. We actually sell more Tabasco in food service in the United States than we sell in the grocery store. And I'll talk to people all the time that say, Tony, you know, when they find out what I do, they say, oh, I know your product, but I've never had it. 
Never eaten Tabasco? No, I don't eat hot food. I don't like hot food. I've never had your product. I said, you go out to eat? Oh, yeah, my wife and I go out to eat twice a week. I say, you have no idea how much Tabasco you've consumed. What do you mean? When you cook Tabasco, the heat cooks out. What stays is flavor. An enormous amount of Tabasco gets put in food in the kitchen, but because the heat doesn't transfer through in the finished meal, people don't realize that the way chefs are making that food taste so good is by putting red Tabasco in the food in the kitchen because that heat cooks out and the flavor comes through. So. Were there any non-negotiables that came from your predecessor? Like the Holy Grail, you can't touch this process or you can't change that? Or was it... It's a, no, it's a good question. And actually, there are some... some whole, we, we aged pepper for three years. Remember, the management team pays for all the capital it uses. You saw all those barrels of pepper. It's a huge amount of money. It's a huge amount of inventory. I could cut that by two thirds, but I'd cut the quality of the product and I'd get rid of some of the premium that we ask people to pay for because of the way we make our product. So um, the reason I check pepper mash in the morning isn't because my people don't know how to do it. The reason I do it is to enforce to my whole workforce that if it's worth the CEO's time to come down here at nine o'clock in the every morning and check 96 barrels of pepper mash and taste them and make sure it's right, there's nothing that we do that any of them is ever going to do that's more important than making sure this product is right 100% of the time, every time. Because you're only as good as the last bottle that somebody bought from you. So. Yes, sir. So, yeah, no, it's um, the seeds we dry and we sell most of that seed to a company in Michigan. And um, you measure heat in food by what's called a Scoville scale, Scoville units. And as a concept, red Tabasco, regular red Tabasco is about 2,500 to 5,000 Scoville units. That's what's in the bottle. That's how many. And Scoville designed this scale based on how many drops of water it took for a fixed amount of product before he couldn't taste any more heat in it. You know, it was an organoleptic thing. Now we do it with gas chromatographs. But the heat level in regular red Tabasco is 2,500 to 5,000 Scoville units. The seed that uh, we make it from, we dry it and send to a company in Michigan, and they distill an oleoresin of capsaicin, which is the active ingredient that creates the heat in the pepper, of Tabasco that's four million Scoville units. And they use it for things like uh, pepper spray or deep heat rub, you know, those are the, the uses. So the, the, most of the seed goes to make either um, uh, pharmaceutical type products like deep heat or uh, a pepper spray. Um, the, uh, uh, the skins and the, uh, the, the leftover pulp, um, we do industrial products that we sell to other food manufacturers that they use to blend in with whatever they're trying to do to get some additional heat in their foods. So, so we try to make sure nothing goes to waste. We don't like to throw things away. So. Yes, sir. I'm sure the corporation is doing donations. Who decides what kind of philotropic efforts the corporation should do, not the shareholders, but the corporation, and how do they decide how much of the company's profits to give away? Um, because we're an S-Corp, most of our earnings that we don't need to run the company are distributed to the shareholder, and so um, we let our shareholders decide how much of their earnings they want to contrib distribute to whatever uh, uh, charity or, or product or whatever uh, that uh, they're uh, passionate about. Uh, with 130 shareholders, I, I can't support all their causes. So the way we address that was simply to disperse the funds to them, and then they can figure it out on theirs. So we do do some charitable giving, and we do some things in our local region, uh, supporting high schools, colleges. Um, 
activities, United Way, that type of thing. But the vast majority of the giving comes directly from the shareholder, not from the company. What are the consumer, what is the risk liability associated with hot sauce? How hot is too hot? And I've always wondered about that. Well, the good news is that although it burns, it doesn't really hurt, okay? It feels like it hurts, but I mean, it doesn't actually blister or burn you or uh, scald you or uh, create an issue. So uh, while it may cause some uh, discomfort, as you saw in the 60 Minutes video with people seeing how hot they could get. Oh, that's a 20-minute burn. Um, what we're finding is that there is a bigger and bigger and bigger market for hotter and hotter items. So uh, our latest sauce, which we're selling over the internet and at our country store at Avery Island, but we're not really selling it in food stores, although we are selling it, I think, in, a shop, in ShopRite uh, in the Northeast, is a scorpion sauce. Remember I talked about red Tabasco is 2,500 to 5,000 Scoville units? That scorpion sauce is 50,000 Scoville units. It's 10 to 20 times as hot as Tabasco. And, and there's a market for it. So, you know, who knows how hot is hot? Everybody's concept of hot is different. But that's also why we have all the different sauces. You know, um, the sweet and spicy uh, is 300 to 600 Scoville units. Um, the, the green is 600 to 1,200 Scoville units. The Chipotle sauce is, uh, is uh, 1,200 to 1,800 Scoville units. You know, and, and we have a habanero that's about 7,000 Scoville units. So we have a whole range of sauces made with different peppers, and they also have different heat levels involved with them. Have you ever considered um, going into a different brand, like establishing a different brand or a different product line that's kind of associated but a whole other direction? Um, we tried clothing. That didn't work out. So <laughs> we gave it a pretty good shot, but, you know, because um, our marks are fairly recognizable and we thought we may have some opportunities there. Clothing business, pretty tough business. We, we didn't do too good. Um, we did try to buy a competitor. Um, in the early 90s, before I got there. Um, the only thing we did worse than buying that competitor was selling that competitor, which also didn't do much for my family. And as, as you remember, uh, I told you earlier, uh, we made a fairly poor investment back in the 20s, and that soured my family on debt and on uh, taking on any kind of debt to expand. Um, the acquisition we made in the 90s was, uh, it didn't hurt the company, but it sure didn't help us, and uh, it didn't go well. So uh, while we never say no to mergers and acquisitions or to looking at new things, uh, you know, our business plans for the last uh, 20 years have been based primarily on organic growth. Uh, we're very good at what we do. And so we try to spend our time and our money doing what we know we're good at. And then we'll continue to look to see if something comes forward uh, that might make sense for us. teach your employees about EVA and how often do you share during the course of the year the financials with them so they understand uh, what profits might look like? So um, we actually do workshops for our employees to, to get them to understand EVA uh, and since it affects how much money they make you'd be amazed at how sophisticated they get on financials real quick but uh, because it has something to do with them. Um, we also encourage them to give us ideas on how we can save because the person doing the job probably knows more about it and knows more about how to save money in that job. So we keep an EVA database that are ideas that our employees give us on how to improve EVA performance. And then every month we tell them exactly where we are against what our goals are and where we are benchmarked. So if our goal for the year is one X, you know, one times, um, then as we plot that, we put it on the bulletin board for them every, uh, every month. We don't go into detailed financials with our uh, employees. We don't give them the actual numbers. We just show them where they are in relation to where they're expected to be and, and where they're going. But we do it on a monthly basis. Yes, sir. With the large warehouse that you built, uh, 
assume that was built with cash. Did you hold back distributions that, that shareholders knew that was going to happen? Um, no. No. Um, we're not really capital intensive. We do the same thing over and over and over again. Um, the new visitor center we built at Avery Island uh, was six and a half million dollars. We did that with cash. Um, but we set the distributions, even though we distribute most of the cash, we do do in part of our five year plan, uh, we're very conscientious about our capital and what we're gonna need and what our capital needs are gonna be. So we factor that in to distributions to make sure I don't ever need to go to one of my cousins and tell them, ah, you know, I'm not going to be able to pay you this year. I ain't going to be there if that happened. You did hold back a little no, we're not, no we, we don't hold back. It, what we do do is determine how much capital we're going to need, and then, and then we do our, our cash flow projections, and as I said, we do fairly detailed cash flow projections uh, on uh, what we're going to have to have. If we needed to borrow, we have an enormous amount of borrowing facility available to us. But um, we have never been in a position to date where we're going to distribute less to the shareholder this year than we distributed the year before. Never. Okay, let's get one more question. Uh, given that you're uh, importing you know, the peppers from uh, farms overseas, uh, manufacturing domestically and then serving 180 markets. How concerned is the company about the rising trade tension globally? Uh, we're actually up to 190 countries, so we're very concerned about trade tensions. Uh, at the same time that we're concerned about it, um, I'd note that China just hit us with a 25% tariff on Tabasco to import it into China. That's on top of the 41 percent they were already charging me. So um, is it fair? No. You know, why is China charging me a 41 percent tariff to protect their uh, internal consumers? So in the sense of the rising tensions and, and how it affects us, we don't like it. But at the same time, uh, we would like to see it addressed. And we would like to see, because we export to so many companies, uh, uh, countries, uh, we would like to see a more level playing field for U.S. products in, in the countries where we're not getting a level playing field now. But it is a, it is a serious consideration. Fortunately, it hadn't affected sales, you know, even in the countries that have hit us with tariffs. So. Okay, well, thanks again for your attention. Let's give Tony another round of applause. Thank you so much.